joined by uh, my colleagues in order of appearance, uh, Councillor Ed Flynn, Councillor Anissa Sabi George, Councillor Kim Janey, and Councillor Frank Baker. Uh, I want to remind everybody that this is a public hearing recorded and broadcasted on uh, Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon Channel 1964. It's also streamed on the City of Boston webpage. Please silence your cell phones and other devices. We'll take public testimony at the end of the hearing. If you could sign up to my left here in that far corner. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation, your residence. Please limit your comments to a couple minutes as uh, there'll be uh, many people who want to have uh, something to say and they should be heard. Uh, this budget review will encompass around 34 hearings, roughly six weeks, so we've got about four more weeks to go. Uh, we strongly encourage residents, whether it's here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to engage in the process by giving testimony for the record. You can do that in several ways. You can obviously come to the hearings. Uh, you can come to a hearing uh, dedicated for public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, uh, and that's any time from 2 to 6 p.m., uh, and we'll hear uh, you in that time frame. Or you can send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means uh, to City Hall, or you can email uh, the Committee of Ways and Means at CCC dot wm at boston dot gov. Today's hearing is Boston Centers for Youth and Families, BCYF, and the Youth Engagement Employment Agency, YEE, FY20 uh, budget. These are dockets number 0622 through 0625, orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriations for the school department, uh, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, or OPEB, uh, and the appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements. This is also dockets numbers 0626 through 0628, uh, which is the capital budget appropriations, including uh, loan orders, lease, and purchasing. Uh, some people, there was some confusion. Uh, later on will be the revolving funds. That, ha that's, that, will, uh, that hearing will start at 4.30, uh, and that's regarding uh, docket number 0637 in the BCYF uh, revolving fund. Um, so uh, if you could just have your, uh, your name and your affiliation and uh, your opening comments and, uh, and welcome to the budget hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, McCarthy. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, thank you for always being a champion of BCYF. I know this is probably the last time we see ourselves in this capacity, uh, but we're from the same neighborhood. And I hope to find you at the Muni every once in a while. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to present BCYF's uh, fiscal year uh, 20 budget. I would like to introduce uh, the BCYF staff who have joined me on the floor here today, uh, Deputy Commissioner Christopher Biner, uh, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Programming, and Michael Saprizio, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Administration and Finance. We also have a numerous number of BCYF staff who are here on the gallery floor with us joining us today. And so I'm honored to, hear, to be here today uh, to uh, share our budget. Um, I want to also thank Mayor Walsh for his continuing confidence in me and, and for the support that he continues to provide BCYF uh, day in and day out for the important work that we do. In your packets, you have documents that outline our fiscal year 19 accomplishments and also our fiscal year initiatives. Before I take a few minutes to highlight a few of our accomplishments for you, I would also like to thank Chief Martinez and his support uh, for bringing the Human Services Cabinet Department together. Uh, in the last few months, we've uh, actually been working on a lot of initiatives that look at deepening our relationships between each of our departments and to really begin to focus on what we can also do to help our communities uh, be better served. Under his leadership, uh, we've come together on a collective impact work, and some of the areas that we were going to be hopefully tackling together as a cabinet is to looking at how we can contribute around the question around housing and supporting our constituents uh, to put them on a path to ensure that they have the housing stability that they need. So I do uh, commend him for his effort and his work for bringing each of our cabinets together around this. Um, so to continue, I want to proudly hopefully share with you some of our accomplishments for this fiscal year. Uh, we've expanded our professional development trainings for all our BCYF staff. We've recently expanded our family gym programming uh, to three of our BCYF centers this spring, and we'll eventually uh, run it out of nine centers uh, due to the increased funding that we got from one of our wonderful uh, 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 partners at Boston Children's Hospital. We expanded our Super Teens pre-employment program for 13 and 14-year-olds, and our Junior Celtics program has also increased uh, throughout our network. We continue to make capital investments in BCYF facilities with the completion of renovations to the BCYF Gallivan and Vine Street Community Centers this summer, 
and the completion of the site study for the new community center in the North End. We held shelter trainings for our BCYF staff, refreshing the process for staff who had been trained before and bringing new staff up to speed. We executed a memorandum of agreement between the BCYF's uh, sites and local community councils, helping to address inconsistencies across the sites, but helping to also define the role and the responsibilities of the site councils. We've issued an RFP to acquire a new system that meets our data and operational needs to provide constituent members with better services, integrate more seamlessly with other BCYF um, sites and city systems, and we'll be able to grow and change um, in the years to come as we change and grow ourselves. Through the City of Boston Analytics, we were awarded a digital fellow who worked with us to produce an interactive map which allowed users to explore BCYF facilities and their features on our website homepage. The map went live on our website this past March. We continue our partnership with the Boston Celtics Foundation that has resulted in a complete renovation of the BCYF Marshall Teen Center and the Rosendale Community Center's basketball court. We continue our partnership with Kaboom, resulting in a brand new playground at the BCYF Gallivan Community Center that's benefiting our center, but also the Gallivan uh, housing development as well. Now, I would like to mention a few of the initiatives that we have planned for fiscal year 20. Um, Starting off first, we will rebrand and reframe the Street Worker Program in order to provide better supports and opportunities that promote positive behavioral change. The new program will be renamed to the Boston Street Outreach Advocacy and Response, uh, the acronym for it, Boston SOAR. We will continue to build off a successful inclusionary after-school program at one of our community centers for children with visible and hidden disabilities to expand it to other BCYF centers across the city. We will begin a strategic planning process that will help BCYF best understand where we are now, where we should be heading, and how we will get there. This process will involve the people who know us best, our members, partners, staff, and other key community stakeholders. We will continue the capital investments in the BCYF facilities with upcoming renovations to BCYF Curley and the Matterhunt Community Centers and the Paris Street Pool and the relocation studies for new community centers in Charlestown and Dorchester. We will partner with our foundation for BCYF to continue to identify and engage strategic partnerships and secure new large institutional sponsors and financial support to support our important work. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. It's an honor to be working for a mayor and working with the city council that are committed to working with us to create transformative relationships. I look forward to discussing our proposed fiscal year budget with you now, but I think that before I move on, I probably will turn the floor over to our colleague, uh, uh, Rashad Cope, who's the director of DYE, to maybe share a little bit of his accomplishments and initiatives. Uh, Commissioner Morales, thank you very much, um, and counselors, um, thank you for having me here today. Um, and a special thank you again to you, Council McCarthy, um, just for your work and service um, to the neighborhoods of Boston, and, and best of luck um, to you with your future endeavor, endeavors as you move I forward. I called the whole plan. I need a job, so. Oh, uh, <laughs> man. That doesn't exist anymore. No. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be um, brief in my remarks. Um, so fiscal year 19 has, has been a great year for the work of youth engagement and employment. Um, I am extremely thankful and humbled by the continued experience um, to lead and serve in the work of driving opportunities for young people and service providers across the city of Boston. Um, a couple of very important structural changes has happened with our office over this past year, uh, which I believe is important to share with you. Um, one is um, our office was elevated to an independent department level under the leadership of Chief Martinez and the Health and Human Service Cabinet. Um, this elevation is intended to allow us to further advance engagement, employment, and enrichment outcomes for youth across the city of Boston, uh, specifically around youth workforce development and civic leadership. Um, and secondly, um, we have also moved 
into a strategic planning process with the aim of drastically improving current department services um, and clearly identifying new priorities for the department over the next couple of years. Um, this is the first noted strategic planning process of this particular department. Um, two very high level notable moments um, that really capture the importance of our work um, this past year. Um, in early fall, we actually um, held a Ready, Set, Success event. Uh, Ready, Set, Success was an opportunity for workforce development and career readiness for young people. It was an event sponsored by JobCase, and it was in partnership with a few other companies, Dress for Success, Salvation Harmony, My Brother's Keeper, uh, where youth ages 15 to 25 had access to free professional headshots in which they could use for their resumes, portfolios. Um, we, were, we were able to give them free professional clothes, on-site resume assistance, hair and hygiene products. Um, and the aim of the event was really to connect Boston's youth um, to the resources they needed to be prepared for success in the workplace. And we saw nearly over 100 youth and families attend this event. Um, and then secondly, um, vote 16. So we also oversee the Mayor's Youth Council and civic engagement programming uh, for youth across the city of Boston. And this year, the Mayor's Youth Council Civic Engagement Committee, they met with State Rep Andy Vargas in mass vote to voice their strong interest in support of vote 16, which was lowering the voting age to 16 years of age. Um, as you know, this was a, leg a legislative proposal amended by Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, uh, it was defeated by the House of Reps, but the important thing is that this effort to engage in this civic policy recommendation for youth was great, um, as they will continue to feel empowered and push for initiatives they believe in as long as adults and other elected officials support them. Um, these efforts define our work. Um, as human service work is passion work, but more importantly, it is advocacy work, it is collaborative work, um, and it is work that addresses opportunity gaps for community constituents. Um, as, as Commissioner Morales mentioned, you guys also may have our uh, fiscal year 19 um, accomplishments and also our fiscal year 20 goals and initiatives as well. Um, so let me just highlight a few couple, couple of things in those areas um, and then um, just turn it back over to you. Um, so, also as Commissioner Morales mentioned, as part of HHS leadership, um, the Cabinet um, has engaged in collective impact work around affordable housing and housing stability. The primary focus for human service departments has been efforts to prevent housing displacement. Um, other departments within the HHS Cabinet has efforts in place to support this. Our focus as an office um, has been on providing job opportunities to youth whose families are in affordable housing in BHA, Boston Housing Units, to help them achieve housing stability. So questions we are asking ourselves is how many youth whose families live in affordable housing are receiving youth jobs? Um, and also, are youth jobs wages contributing to housing instability for families in affordable housing? Um, as families are required to report youth wages as income, uh, we have, we're questioning whether or not that has been a challenge for some of the families and young people that we're serving. Um, also, there's a strong focus across HHS, Economic Development, Office of Workforce Development, BPS, and the Education Cabinet around workforce development, pathways, and pipeline opportunities to prepare youth to compete for middle-skilled jobs. Uh, and we are actively engaged in those discussions as well. Um, we oversee the city's SuccessLink Youth Jobs Program, um, your, your old Hope Line <laughs> program, uh, in which um, we provide access to over 3,000 youth job opportunities for young people across the city. In summer of 2018, um, we hired just um, nearly 3,000 young people and placed them in various jobs opportunities across the neighborhoods of Boston. Um, we saw nearly 6,400 youth register for the employment program. Uh, we partnered with 181 community-based organizations across the city of Boston 
to offer these workforce development experiences to these young people. Majority of the jobs, as we continue to see, are located in Roxbury, Dorchester, um, and Mattapan. Some of our major partners um, have been the Box Center, um, our BCYF centers, Boston Public Health Commission, our Parks and Rec, Young People Project, Freedom House, Wright Boston, South End Tech Center, and Supreme Judicial Corps. Um, additionally, um, with our programs and partnerships, uh, we continue to see refunding from the state to administer career development programming to young people who are participating in our youth jobs program. Uh, we were awarded an annual grant from the Youth Works program administered um, by the Massachusetts Commonwealth Corporation in which that grant is designed to provide low-income teens and young adults access to employment opportunities and work readiness training. Um, that funding is used to ensure disadvantaged youth, vulnerable youth, um, and youth with identified risk barriers have access to employment opportunities. Um, and through that grant, um, we were able to serve 474 eligible youth who self-identified um, with particular risk barriers. Uh, we were able to hire five career development coaches to implement work readiness training for the youth participants. Um, and we were able to administer over 180 hours of career development workshops around workplace safety, learning, strength and interest, professionalism, dependability, um, sexual harassment, um, effective communication to these young people as well. Uh, additionally, we partnered with the John Hancock MLK Scholars Program um, to expand access to EBIFI financial literacy training using online modules. Um, we saw nearly over 100 young people participating in that. Uh, we partnered with Bank of America and the One Love Foundation to incorporate healthy relationship trainings and workshops as a part of our, our programming as well. Um, and we initiated conversations with Bunker Hill Community College um, to launch a Learn and Earn initiative, which is to provide college credit building opportunities for two students who took part in the programming this past summer. Um, and lastly, our engagement and outreach efforts continues to move our work forward. Um, this work has raised the visibility of our services and positioned our department to lead in youth advocacy and civic engagement space. Um, this work um, ha has been important because it's determined how we communicate, how we engage, and how we connect youth, parents, and providers to our work. Um, within our engagement and outreach work, um, we hosted a partnership mixer, which is an opportunity to engage and recruit new community-based organizations and partners to become a part of our youth jobs program. Um, as a result of our partnership mixer, we attracted nearly 19 new partner organizations. Some of those organizations happen to be Boston Police Area B3 Police Station, the Calculus Project, uh, which focuses on uh, mathematics and engineering, um, the City of Boston Love Your Block program, um, and Apprentice Learning. Um, additionally, um, we hosted on Saturday, March 30th, um, our annual City of Boston Youth Jobs and Resource Fair, um, in which the mayor uh, was able to attend. Um, we saw just over 5,000 young people register for that event, and we saw nearly 3,000 young people attend the event on that day. Um, that event, it welcomed youth job seekers, families, and employment partners to engage in a very interactive and formative job fair. For the first time ever, we were actually able to place nearly 400 young people with jobs on the spot at that particular job fair. Um, the, the Mayor's Youth Council continues to serve as our civic engagement platform to leverage youth voice and youth leadership. Um, there are a few projects that NYC focused on this year. Um, the Youth Leads to Change, um, Public Health and Safety, Youth Talkbacks, um, and Arts and Culture, or BHA Mural. Uh, and we're continuing right now in our process to administer the Youth Lead to Change initiative across the city of Boston, where young people are voting on how to spend a million dollars of the city's budget. Um, and then we have continued to expand outreach and engagement for the MBTA's Youth Pass program, 
Um, we're also managing um, access to affordable transit through the Youth Pass program. Um, this year, we were able to enroll and connect 2,245 eligible participants um, to the, the Youth Pass program, in which 68% of them were enrolled in Mass Health, 9% of them were BHA participants, and 23% of them were enrolled in workforce development programs. Um, and in closing, um, I feel that we're positioning ourselves at the right time to create space for progress, opportunity, and innovation around youth advancement. And our goal is to continue advancing opportunities for young people and the organizations and agencies who serve them. We are connecting youth and young adults to programs, resources, and opportunities, advocating for youth voice, youth leadership within city government and across departments and neighborhoods. Um, many thanks to you for listening and um, just to understand how important this work is. And um, most importantly, how important this work is across every neighborhood in the city of Boston. So thank you. Thank you, Rashad. Thank you very much. Uh, and we've been joined by uh, City Council President Andre Campbell, and she disappeared, uh, Councilor Matt O'Malley, and uh, Councilor Wu. Um, Chair recognizes uh, Councilor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley, and thank you to the panelists for, for being here. I'd like to first talk about the $15 million investment and renovation for the Curley Recreation Center. I would like to say thank you to Mayor Walsh um, and his administration. I know Pat Brophy is, is playing a, a role on it as well. The yell, as we call it, is a jewel in, in the city and for the people of South Boston for decades, generations. It has served our community so well, people playing handball, racquetball, running, swimming, uh, work, weightlifting. It's also an outlet for our seniors to spend time down there. Um, it, it's great for people that are in the recovery community as well. They participate in physical fitness. Um, it's, a great, it's, a great, it's a great program for the city. Um, what kind of improvements can we expect in terms of building renovations in the layout? Um, thank you, Councilor. So we're, we're in the middle of the design process right now, um, and, and the, the Curley Community Center is, is a top priority of the mayor's um, with regards to his list of, of capital improvements. Um, so we're, we're currently in the design process um, where we obviously are also dealing with um, making sure the building's resilient with regards to the, uh, the tides and, and the property being on the water. So we've had some stakeholder meetings with different agencies that are going to intersect to help us solve that solution, um, but have a designer on board moving forward with, with design and, and exploratory work right now with regards to um, the water and different existing conditions within the building and hope to have um, a community meeting with, you know, our first community community meeting within the next, within the near future. Um, but really you can expect, um, you know, layout, it's really going to be a, a, um, a very in-depth uh, renovation with uh, interior layout changes, uh, you know, maybe some new areas. Again, we're not, you know, totally into design um, just yet, but, uh, you know, features like what you see now with regards to fitness areas and, and, and um, uh, aerobic areas and group fitness areas as well as, you know, things like we're hoping for things like a computer lab, um, a teen center, after school room. Um, so, you know, along with all a lot of new mechanical systems, uh, HVAC, uh, a lot of different things. There's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a big project. So um, it's definitely a priority. It's definitely going to be a um, a pretty uh, extensive project and, and a project we're looking forward to. As you mentioned, it is it is a really unique um, property that we enjoy having in our you know portfolio and look forward to bringing some major improvements to that building for uh, so it can continue to serve the South Boston community for uh, for years to come. Yeah, thank you for that update. I know you talked about after school program programming and that's critical. Child care, early child care education. Um, as we, as we go further in talking about these issues, can we also have a robust conversation and plan on safety in terms of crossing the street, navigating the street? I know we've talked on the phone in the past, but I've always been concerned about um, crossing the boulevard, even, even if the lights are red, um, red but it's, it's a difficult, to, difficult location to, to cross. 
-hmm. for pedestrians. Um, is that also part of our uh, thinking and strategy? Um, so, I mean, with regards to the roadway, that, that, that's a state-run, state-maintained roadway there. Um, so jurisdiction for us is a little bit of, you know, an issue. And I know the state's done a lot of different things with, with the speed humps and different things that, that they're trying to explore, that they've worked with us on, on trying to help. Um, in the meantime, what we've done is we've tried to dedicate, you know, at, at certain times, trying to uh, dedicate folks that can act as crossing guards during the summertime yeah. when there's summer programming going on and things like that trying our best to help uh, mitigate the issues of that. I mean, I've crossed a number of times also, and we understand the, uh, you know, the dangers involved with, with, with that roadway, and we know that the state very much is, she has that concern with some of the recent work they've been doing, you know, uh, taking it down to one lane in some areas and different exercises. But we'll obviously work with, uh, you know, DCR and, and, and Mass DOT as we do the project with regards to, you know, entrances and exit ways and placement of crosswalks and things like that. Um, so we will definitely make sure that that's part of the discussion. We just may not have a direct. Uh, yeah, that, that should be part of the discussion. We should all be also be working on that now as we approach the uh, summer season as well. Um, new equipment and upgrades, what are we looking at? So with every capital project comes um, FF&E &E money uh, on top of the capital budget. Uh, so there'll be a, a pot of money set aside for uh, furnish, furnishings, fixtures, and equipment, which will include new, new fitness equipment, new, uh, new furniture, new um, computers, new classroom furniture, if there's an after school room. So with every capital project that, that we've um, taken under in the recent past has included a pretty healthy um, FF&E budget that allowed us to change and, and replace and purchase new additional furniture and fixtures and again, fitness equipment, all the things that come with furnishing the building after the project's over. So um, that's also a big part of the capital project. Obviously further down, once construction gets started, we start having those discussions around what types of items are needed, but um, it's absolutely be part of this, this project. Um, would it, talk briefly about accessibility for persons with disability and our seniors. Yeah, so I mean with every project that we do we work with public facilities and um, depending on the level of um, depending on the level of uh, repairs being done we have to we have to comply with with uh, different codes and regulations in ADA accessibility um, so we will make sure that you know the building is fully accessible to those that you know the buildings one level on pretty much on just about ground level which is nice uh, gets a little more challenging for us when we have uh, multi-level buildings that might not be, uh, it might be set back or things like that. So um, we'll make sure that we meet all the codes around accessibility and, and things like things like that when we do this project. But again, this one is a little bit less of a concern just because of the fact that it's one level. Um, obviously, we'll we'll address the layout issues with regards to being able to walk from one end of the building to the other. Um, right now, where it's it's kind of cut off or disjointed a little bit from the men's locker room. So we're going to deal with all those. Um, layout issues along with this project, but accessibility will absolutely be uh, enhanced um, as part of this project uh, to make sure that everyone of all uh, walks of life and all abilities can, can access the facility. Thank you, and um, I just want to shift focus a little bit. I know you were talking, uh, sir, about healthy relationships in BCYF and their outreach to um, some students. I'm working with the council president on domestic violence awareness related issues. Um, what can you talk about in terms of healthy relations as it, ha as it has an impact on potential domestic violence? Are we educating young people on, on those types of issues? Yeah, so through our Youth Jobs um, Program, uh, we've worked with One Love Foundation, and One Love Foundation um, has presented a curriculum to really educate and provide a safe space um, for young people to have those discussions around healthy relationships. Um, those workshops were administered to about 40 young people during the summer of 2018. Um, so we're working to continue the relationship uh, with One Love Foundation for this upcoming summer, but we do recognize that there's um, a need to have those, expand those conversations, um, you know, during the school year and also um, to more young people as well. Could, could I recommend that you communicate with uh, BPS See if you can partner up with them and maybe do some outreach in the schools as well? Yeah, we absolutely could. Okay. And if funding is an issue, could you come back to the city council and let us know? We want to try to 
educate as many young people as we possibly can on that important issue. Yeah, sure. Thank you for taking my questions. Thank you very much, okay. Councillor. Councillor Nisa Sabi George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being here and your thoughtful presentation. Um, you noted in the additional investment that BCY BCYF will receive this year, um, there's an additional investment for supporting the community center site councils. Can you talk a little bit about the transition that's happened over the last year with the site councils sort of, I think, separating or detaching from each of the, the community center from the site council and what these new positions will do? Uh, which, so which, three hundred and twenty thousand dollars for an additional finance position um, okay. to support the community center site councils. Sure. You, uh, you want to start? Or you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the finance position, just to talk a little bit about the finance position, that's the the, the, the site councils aren't aren't separating from the community centers. There's there's a little bit of difference with regards to where the revenue that, that's being generated is going. It's it's now coming back. Um, when somebody signs up for a membership or somebody, somebody decides they want to rent a part of the facility, it is now coming back to the city of Boston. So there is revenue now coming into BCYF that didn't exist prior, um, which entails additional procurement, additional um, bookkeeping, and additional means to, to collect and account for those funds. So that's why the additional finance position there. And the other additional money is that we're going to start paying for things that out at the community centers that we didn't typically pay for as a city before. Um, so there's money in there because we've been collecting revenue since December 1st. So budget has now budgeted us for next year based on the money that we've collected so far that will allow us to procure items for the sites that we typically didn't procure in the past. So that money will be to purchase office supplies, uh, fix fitness equipment, um, put you know, uh, there's, there's an increase in the vehicle usage to put fuel in the vehicles. Those are just some expenses that we didn't pay for prior that we will be procuring for the site, for the community centers moving forward where that won't be, that, that expense won't be on the site councils any longer. Site councils still exist, site councils still partner with us at the sites. It's just a uh, shift in where the, where the revenue uh, that's being generated at the sites is, is going. So the site councils used to collect those membership fees and all of that? And yes. That, yes. that has changed since That's last changed. year. Yep. Yes. And what has that me meant for revenue to BCYF? Um, it's meant that we didn't have any revenue to now, you know, based on, on December 1st through December 1st, 18 through present, we've collected about $240,000. Um, so it's revenue that BC, BCUIF was never a department that generated revenue. Um, BCUIF now does generate revenue and uh, we are collecting the revenue and, and have processes in place through uh, Treasury in the budget office to account for, collect, uh, and ultimately uh, use those funds to procure things um, for, our, for our site sites that didn't, didn't rely on us to purchase those items yeah. before. And I mean that revenue is not funding the operating cost for BCUIF. That's that is simply it's um, an offset it's, offset. it's, it's an offset i mean and we've it's a operated with the, of the cost a small of small BCY. fraction yeah. yeah um we've never had a penny in revenue before and we we you know we were always funded by the budget office and through um for our operating budget so this is just to offset costs or absorb additional costs or have additional um spending but no we never relied on revenue in the past to operate great thank you that was my timer yes it was your timer Thank you very much. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Kim Janey. Good afternoon. Uh, so first, I um, want to commend and thank you for your incredible work, not just the work that you do every day, but in particular over the holidays, if you recall, I had 200 families in Academy Homes who were without heat, hot water, they couldn't cook, it was Christmas, um, and you opened up one of your centers to make sure that they could go and take showers. So thank you for that. No um, <clears throat> um, I have a quick question just to kind of follow up on something that came up last year. The uh, center that you have in Alice Taylor, mm -hmm. um, is that now open? Uh, Smart from the start, I think, was using it and almost exclusively using it. And so the residents at Alice Taylor we're concerned about their access to it, and I know um, Chief Martinez and, and you were working on that. Is that has that been resolved? Is yeah, it I, now I, accessible to the residents? I, I believe we 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 had uh, issue an RFP, and and in the RFP there are talks there is language in there about community usage and access. 
Um, you know, we've worked also with a couple of Alice Taylor's residents and former residents, some who actually happen to be our staff. Some have gone in there and actually on their own time volunteer to actually open up the, the basketball court and run a couple of initial programs. And I believe that we are about, you know, it, and it runs on a yearly RFP process. So if anything, we don't see any of the community usage, we'll get stronger in that language. But it, we'll also have conversations with the Alice Taylor and Smart from the start to make sure they continue to have access to that facility. Um, and, and this is one of those facilities that uh, prior to, to uh, me coming here was one of the consolidated sites that, that fell under the uh, Menino administration. They got consolidated and then allowed it to be, to be given to a community partner to make good use of it. And wonderful, so, wonderful. I want to ask just a, a couple of questions on what we're doing for our youngest residents as well as some of our oldest residents. So just making sure that we're doing more. Yes, Can you talk more about the summer jobs, uh, whether or not we're seeing an increase in the number of jobs, what the sites are, if we can get that data by, by neighborhood uh, as well. It, that's helpful. Also, I'm interested in the young people themselves, what neighborhoods that they live in, you know, they may live in a different neighborhood as the job site, uh, as well as what schools they may be coming from. And then just want to understand more of what we're doing in terms of our senior programming and making sure that we're continuing to invest in those residents. The summer jobs, we can pull that data. Um, we do ask um, some of the demographic information on the applications that we, connect, we collect from the young people around um, their race, around neighborhoods, around schools, um, age. Um, so we do have that information. We can definitely pull that information. Um, and are we, we seeing an increase in the number of jobs for this summer? We are not seeing an increase in the number of jobs. Decrease? Um, our jobs have been saying? level funded. Okay. Um, so every year we normally, um, we normally provide about 3,300 um, job opportunities. 3,100 3, of those job opportunities are for youth between the ages of 15 to 18. And then we provide 200 supervisor positions for youth between the ages of 19 to 24. Um, so since I've been in my role the last three years, that number has been level um, or funded. Yep, and then I want to focus the seniors. I also want to just acknowledge um, that we've got, uh, I share Grove Hall with Council President uh, Campbell, and we've got some seniors from Grove Hall, so I just want to shout them out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, yes. If, older and bolder, I love the hashtag. If you could... Uh, just talk about, I know I heard the buzzer, but if you could also just address the investment in our senior population before I turn it over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, good, um, good afternoon, um, and, and that's a great question because um, we certainly value the wisdom that the older um, Americans bring. And, uh, you know, as you know, a couple years ago, we dedicated um, BCYF Grove Hall um, specifically for that purpose, but we also have the Golden Age um, Center in Charlestown. But beyond that, we have a number of programs across um, our, our network in which um, we're providing intentional programming for seniors, and it's critically important. And one of the programs that I'd love to highlight is um, our fishing program at BCYF Fine Street, in which we're able to bring young people together with um, seniors to fish. Not only is it important that they learn how to fish, right, in more ways than one, um, but they get a chance to engage with each other and, and learn from each other, and I think that's uh, really important. And so- and That's at know, Vine Street? At, at Vine Street, yes. And so we're, you know, certainly um, looking to continue to um, provide um, quality opportunities for our seniors, because they're, um, as you know, they set the foundation um, for us all. Thank you so much. Oh. And, I would, and I would add that, you know, through our partnership with the foundation of PCYF, uh, you know, we also support uh, additional staff that work with senior populations like in the Orenbergen Center. They, they actually do some programming out there. Actually, one of the uh, uh, members there, Alice, was actually featured in the Boston Herald because she was a former World War, World War II uh, veteran, and she was a Marine, and it was a fabulous story. But, you know, she continues to go there every day and engage. And so, of course, you know, I tend to look at my, my seniors, and I don't call them that, you know, active older adults, or my teens, because they're actually the elders empowering network, um, you know, to be sort of the source to continue to guide us in the work that we do, because they know what they want. We just have to listen and figure out how to get it done. Yeah. Chair recognizes President Campbell. 
Um, thank you, Council McCarthy, and thank you, Councilor Janey, for that acknowledgement um, for my sister in service. Um, and thank you guys for the work that you guys are doing um, for all of our residents and creating new spaces or jobs and opportunities for our young folks. Um, it's important work. Um, just some quick questions first. Um, well, actually, I also, also have to acknowledge and appreciate um, Galavan and the, and the playground there has been received, obviously, really well great project, um, the work being done at the Mattahunt, uh, which is exciting. So um, just wanted to thank you for the work, particularly that touches my district. Um, just quickly, Rashad, just res first of all, congratulations on the standalone department. I think it says something about the work that department does um, and gives it sort of the gravitas, frankly. Um, curious um, what your staff is, your budget, um, what do you have now that you have that designation? Yeah, so we currently have, um, we have eight um, full-time staff. Um, staffing capacity um, stands at, at a challenge for us, um, just given the volume of young people um, that we are hiring through our youth jobs program. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive one additional um, FT position for fiscal year 20. Um, so we're definitely grateful for that. So it's eight under 50 fiscal um, year 20? Or it it's will be, it's eight fiscal year 19. It will be nine for fiscal year 20. Uh, and then our budget, um, a large part of our budget um, is certainly our youth wages, uh, which is roughly about like six million. Uh, and that is expected just to go up because minimum wage is going up um, every year. What's your total budget for your office? Um, our total budget is just, um, just under seven million. Just under seven million. Um, and you, you talked about the placement of our young people, about 3,000, about 3,300 jobs, yep. um, but almost 6,500 young people registered for a job. What do you think it, it would take financially to close that gap? Um, and I have to just applaud you on the placement, because I remember one budget hearing early on, we talked about there were some openings left because processes, and, and I think some people were shocked that we actually had some positions available, but the processes weren't quite in place, so we weren't filling those. So applaud you and your team on the work you're doing to make sure every job is filled um, in a, a productive um, employment opportunity. But curious, from your perspective, what do you think it would take to close the gap between the young people we place in jobs and then those who actually um, go through the process to register and apply? Yeah, so I think um, closing the gap, um, one, is additional funding. <laughs> Um, for increased job opportunities for young people. Um, and then it's also um, just data collection. Do you have collections. a number for that? Um, so I don't right now, but I okay. can kind of just pull that information together okay. um, to kind of get a realistic number. Um, and then additionally, it's data collection. So we, um, and we've talked about this before, we know that the 6,400 young people that are applying um, through the city, we also know these young people are applying to jobs through the PIC, right. um, through ABCD, mm -hmm through MLK Scholars. So we've had conversations about better aligning um, youth jobs efforts across all of those providers um, to find a way to, um, to collect data. Because uh, we, we know that young people are not getting, about 3,000 young people aren't getting jobs with us. But what we do not know is whether or not they're getting a job with these other providers. Um, so we have some work to do um, to make sure that we're doing a better job of capturing that data so we can have a real number of the number of young people who are not receiving jobs in terms of the gap. during the summer months and what that gap is. That would be helpful, particularly I was just talking to Councillor Janey and she's part of Council O'Malley since last year on ways to respond to the summer and we know that typically incidents of violence go up, but when our young people have productive things to do, including a job, yep. where they're not being, where they're being paid, um, that is one way to sort of combat it. So really Absolutely. appreciate that. I, did I hear the buzz? You I'll did. wait for the next round. Thank All you. Right. Uh, Chair recognizes Council Matt O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for all you do. Uh, the proud product of. Uh, just taking advantage of some of the great community centers in my neighborhood uh, growing up and, and really value not only the youth programming, which is crucial, but we've also seen um, some increase with senior programming, which is also really important as well. So thank you for that. Um, Rashad, uh, congratulations on, on the job well done. Appreciate your great work as it relates to youth summer job employments. Uh, the chairman and I have been talking for years, and I know many of our colleagues are alums of uh, the uh, Red Shirt program and sort of bringing back that specific um, 
outdoor job opportunity that many of, I actually never was a red shirt, I wanna be clear about that, but I, uh, I, I knew many people that were and, and know it's a great program. Has there been any talk about reviving that in some way or adding that component to the summer job programs? Yeah, so we've talked about what that would look like, yeah. um, but our conversations have been more centered around how do we improve job quality for the young people that are working within our jobs program. Um, and we see that it's a collective effort and it's a collective conversation, as mentioned with these other job providers. Yeah. Um, so as we think about what that looks like, uh, I think that we'll have a better idea of the direction that we should be moving in, in <clears throat> terms of revamping and restructuring youth jobs to make sure that it's giving young people an opportunity uh, and preparing them for future career. Yeah. Um, so no, I appreciate that, and I sort of heard that feedback when we initially brought the hearing order back. I guess I would just argue that uh, the quality of the Red Shirts program was something that I think was incredibly valued um, by the city, by individuals to um, have that opportunity, the pride that they felt in making their neighborhoods, their city cleaner, I think is something that um, benefited all of us collectively as a city, as a government, so I do think going forward, I, I hope that uh, we can continue to push that because I think I think the suggestion, and I'm not saying you said this at all, but I had heard this that um, we needed to offer youth better jobs. I, I don't think that that quite encapsulates what the Red Shirts program did for so many people. The Youth Cleanup Corps, of course, is what it was called. I use Red Shirts for, yeah. for shorthand. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can bring that back. And I also think there's an opportunity to look at um, almost a, a winter uh, BYCC um, program to talk about shoveling snow and everything. I know that there's some restrictions as it relates to um, Corey and Sori and those types yep. of things, but I do hope uh, that we can uh, we can uh, continue to move that forward. So that's something yep. I'll be at, continuing to push in the weeks sure. and months ahead. Um, and I apologize, I did have to step out, so you may have gone over this, but um, uh, Commission, briefly talk about the um, permanent employees increase. It seems to be the significant majority of your um, budget increase, the $1.3 million. Yeah, I think my majority Michael. probably exists a little bit in the uh, the revamp of the street worker program. Yep. That's part of it, uh, of what Councillor uh, Asiba mentioned earlier, a little bit about the, uh, the finance person, the additional of that. Uh, we also, one thing that we talked about last year was the, the need that we wanted to expand a little bit more about girls programming, so it has also included like a new girls uh, coordinator to kind of help us support more of gender specific programming. Yeah. And those are some of the pockets. I don't know if uh, Could, uh, uh, just just because I mean my yeah. time is, is limited. Yep. How many total positions is that that's included in fifty one thousand? Line fifty one thousand. Somebody. Else. I think I'm trying to think if it was around. Um, I think it was around ten. P there's there's a couple. There's a couple in the street worker program, there's a finance position, there's a girls only program position, and there's two computer instructor positions. Um, so I'm pretty sure up around 10, incre an increase of 10 on a head count, I think roughly, but okay. those are all the positions that are in that. Okay, and if not, we can get it back to you. Okay, yeah, just curious. Up. Sure. And then finally, there's been some talk, and this may be better served for uh, Chief Cook's uh, hearing next week, but putting, P we actually want a state grant in terms of establishing PV panels on certain, uh, um, uh, community centers, Curtis Hall was one, there was one in Dorchester, and I believe Jackson Man may have been the third, I'm not sure if that's changed, but do you know any, the status of that in terms of, uh, this was a state grant that would build PV panels, solar panels on the roof of three community centers that would be used to try, uh, build battery storage for communication equipment in the event of a natural disaster or otherwise. Any news on that? Um, so I was involved with that, and I remember the announcement being made. Um, I don't ultimately know what happened with those state state yeah. dollars to be honest with you i mean if it was obviously if it was operating i don't know if that was an operating budget or a, like you said a it grant was, that was expended was but yeah and yeah, i don't think it was expended i so. don't think i mean i don't know if we've missed the boat on that i mean we were all ready to go with that um all i can say is that we've been working with um the renew boston trust yeah. um in in doing multiple upgrades at, at our centers which has been great for us and it includes solar panels but not only for backup but for actually generating power at um, the Tobin Community Center, and I believe um, the Roslindale Community Center, if I'm not mistaken, but we're getting a lot of upgrades to that Renew Boston Trust, 
uh, renew Boston Trust, including like I said, you know, low flow toilets, building management systems, Good. Um, solar no, power, that's, that's LED helpful, lighting. Michael. If you could get me before, you know, in the next couple of weeks, just what the status is on those grants, because yep. uh, it'd be important to see. I, I think we were all we celebrated that decision. I want to make sure we didn't miss the boat. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor. I have a couple myself. Uh, um, could I just get an update on the uh, Mattahunt, uh, the design and the, the redo? I appreciate the money that's getting sunk there. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, Councilor Campbell and I um, work diligently with uh, BPS to keep the Haitian strain and make sure that people were calm about the change that was happening there. And, uh, you know, it's Rashad's old stomping ground. But the fact that we're redoing that building makes it a little easier, the transition. So where are we at on that status? Yeah, um, so we're currently in design. We're working with public facilities. Um, we're also getting money from um, Rashad's shop with the um, Youth Lead the Change. I think we're getting about $333,000 to do a, a, a media arts area so that we can keep and bring back some of that theater feeling that, that was there prior. Um, but we're excited because, you know, the mayor made an investment there where we're able to, we're going to fix up the gym. We're going to, the biggest, biggest point for us is the entryway. Um, if we want to feel and look like a community center and feel welcoming, we we want to we want to address that that entryway to be more welcoming to folks. Um, so we are we are going to open that up, put a desk where it needs to be, freshen up the gym, um, redo the computer center, uh, computer lab in the back. So we're in the pr preliminary stages of, of design, but we're actively in the design process, um, and we're uh, you know looking into what those improvements look like. Some initial kind of renderings on ideas from the designers and things but it's it's scheduled it's in design um we hope in the next couple of months have design wrapped up you know or start uh going to the community with some of the design suggestions and then you know hopefully within the next year or so um be ready to go in, into con into construction <clears throat> i've also thought of the the that land that's next to the uh basketball the outdoor basketball courts the other side of the closed in mm -hmm. courts um, that's a perfect opportunity for whether it's the parks or BCYF to... So that property is owned by BPS, but we actually have in our partnership with Kaboom um, that we talked about where we did the playground at Gallivan and Curly and Hyde Park. Yep. They're actually doing play space, play courts now. Okay. So they've approached us and my very first one that I recommended to them was the space outside yeah. at the Matterhunt. So we have a meeting coming up with BPS and Kaboom and ourselves. There where they put a surface over the basketball court to make it more versatile and, and more uses than just a basketball court. Yep. It continue, the basketball court's unusable at this point. So we're gonna partner with Kaboom and the Boston Public Schools to try to do some side projects, maybe bring back some of the community garden, um, fix up the basketball court. So um, Kaboom's looking at like an August project date. Um, so it's fastly approaching, working with um, the development folks, Sandy Holden, and folks to do the um, the application process for Kaboom so we can get, they've been very good to us and they have a funder who's willing to work on that. So that you mentioned, that's our top great. spot for yeah, that, that that's a great opportunity. Spot. Um, last year's big controversy or big questions were the changing of the hours in the BCYF. What's the success of the Saturday night and uh, Sunday openings during the summer? I'm hearing mixed, some sites are going good guns, some sites nobody's there except the workers. How, do we have numbers on that? Yeah, um, we, we, we recently did a, a sort of a poll, so I can actually get you those numbers back, but it still looks like it's very variable, you know what I mean, in regards to keeping those hours open. Um, at the same time, it, it allows us to also partner with other organizations that sometimes can also come in and do stuff uh, okay. within our facilities. So I can definitely get you what we've done recently. In, in, in That'd be great. My, my time's up, so. Yep. Um, I think I might have given myself an extra 30 seconds, too. <laughs> uh, so uh, before we go into round uh, two, we do have a couple people who would like to speak. So I'll take um, out of order. We'll take uh, some public testimony. Um, I know uh, my, my good friend Michael Cuzo is here. Um, and uh, uh, Pelta, if I butcher your name, I apologize. And uh, Glenda uh, and Sarah would all like to speak. So. Um, when, when Michael's done, you can certainly just come right in. If you check the yes by accident, you don't have to come up. I'm not going to force you. All right. Go ahead, Michael. Like thank you. And thank you for your service. I want to thank all the counselors. I want to thank BCYF and DYE. We're partners with uh, pretty much uh, folks who are here. In fact, we were communicating with some of the street workers now, just trying to address some of our challenges during dismissals. And we want to thank our BCYF staff for their uh, tremendous help there. 
On behalf of Project Right, I'm here today to ask the City Council, along with the Mayor, to prioritize to begin programming studies to develop options for particular community centers in Dorchester that is in the BCYS budget. As you know, the Grove Hall neighborhood is one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in Boston with a high concentration of young people. Yet since uh, Ju July of 2016, and just weeks after the homicide of a Burke student, outside of school, youth after school and recreational programming was discontinued in the uh, Grove Hall. We understood that, we knew that when we first built and did the renovation of the Burke and we went to the planning to do the construction, that we knew that the community center was gonna be limited and we would have to look for future expansion in terms of uh, the much needed services that's needed in Grove Hall. So we're clearly at, at that point in time. So for almost three years now, the city has not provided after school recreational youth programming out of this public building or school facilities for Grove Hall neighborhood youth. What message will City Hall send to Burke students and other Grove Hall young people? That City Hall will fast track a recreational marijuana shop about 500 feet from, from that, their school, but for three years cannot provide after school youth recreational programming in their neighborhood. We can do better and City Hall should fast track the process for expanding youth after school recreational and summer programming for young people in Grove Hall. The Frederick had also had its middle school football team cut this past year. These prevention activities allow school staff and youth workers to build relations with young people, have leverage with them to follow through on their schoolwork and to make healthy choices. But when there are limited positive opportunities and resources available for them, what decisions will, we, will they make? We look forward to working with you in expanding BCYS recreational after school programming for young people and also for seniors as part of this facility. As you know, potential vacant lots are going fast, so this process must be expedited. My last point is we need a pedestrian activated crosswalk light on, Gre on Geneva Ave across from the Grove Hall Senior Center. Seniors have been almost been hit. Wheelchair bound um, residents have a hard time crossing that. Um, the, the, the presently designed crosswalk that also has been um, um, cars have run over and it's been um, pretty much impacted by, by its uh, uh, visibility. And stuff. But we look forward to working with you. Thank you. And I, Thank I have uh, my statement here. So. You want to talk about that? Cross, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, we'll make sure the uh, PED request gets to uh, BTD. Yeah. Okay. Is anybody else who wanted to speak or is that just a. Oh, we do, all right. You could just introduce yourself and speak into the mic and away we go. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Petra Bruno Morrison. Although I live in Campbell's district, Councillor Campbell's district, I actually, my second home is the Grove Hall uh, Senior Center. And just a quick few words, we, we are hoping that you continue to fund the Senior Center, because the, sen the Senior Center um, is a beacon for many of us. Uh, the programs they provide on a daily basis are varied. We have a lot of exercise programs every day. Uh, some of the other programs that we do are Tai Chi, Cheer Yoga, Bagua, which is the cousin to Tai Chi. We have Spanish Club, which is one of my very favorites. We have line dancing, which is quite popular. We do jewelry making, aqua aerobics, we have computer programs, that some of the young people have come to the center and they've worked with us to do Word and Excel and Access, and it's really wonderful. We uh, have several educational programs and some of the topics include uh, blood pressure management, diabetes management, we have Alzheimer's, we had an Alzheimer's program this Monday. and. I'm really shocked. I worked in healthcare for over 30 something years, and I was really shocked as to what Alzheimer's can do to the average person, and that was really educational for us. We had our financial planning. We um, go to the theater, we go to the symphony. We even go out to, where do we go in the summer, ladies? For the summer, for the symphony? For the symphony. <laughs> <laughs> Not Southie, trust me. <laughs> and um, we have a lot of balance uh, and exercise classes. There was one, a couple of people who could only stand on two feet. Now we can all stand uh, on one foot and, and hold our arms out for more than a minute. So it's really, really good. And the staff, what can I say? 
We have the best staff in the city. They're really patient, supportive, helpful, respectful, and they welcome us and make us feel at home. And they go above and beyond, especially with Spanish club. Above and beyond, and they do, and they really make us welcome. And AD, I'm not sure if you know AD, who is the head? AD, please. Thank you. We need some of that in City Hall. <laughs> that, might be, that might be the issue that's in this building. We need some of you, Glenda. Hi, good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of the Grove Hall Senior Center. I am 72 years, going on 73 years old. And I am here to testify for the Grove Hall Center. Before I went to the Grove Hall Center, I would sit home and just be idle. But going to the Grove Hall Center, they have computer classes. They have financial classes. They teach you how to use the computer. We socialize with each other. We have quilting. We play music. We dance. We have a good time. We don't feel like we're 72 years old and 80-something years old. We enjoy each other's company. So I'm here to testify for them that all day, it's a drop-in center. So you could go for the things that you like and the things that you don't really need to go for. The days you want to go, you go. We even have aerobics, water aerobics, if you want to do that. So I, I want to testify that the Grove Hall Center is the place. So please fund the Grove Hall Center. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Naomi Robertson, and I'm 70 years old, and I do attend the Grove Hall Community Center, Senior Center also. I've been there since um, last summer, and it's truly made a difference in my life, a great difference. I'm livelier. My kids always say to me, <laughs> you know, you're a completely different person since you've <laughs> been there. This center is one of the best, if not the best, in Boston. I've been to a few, but never been to a center like this. I really enjoy working with the um, staff. The staff is so warm, friendly, just kind. They make sure that we get enough to eat. I might not look like I eat a lot, but <laughs> they feed us. They make sure that we have something there all the time. But I agree with my um, fellow members that this center has so many activities that we, you know, sometimes we just, hey, we run out of space. So we need the funding. We're <laughs> believing that that's what we're going to continue to get, all the funding that we need. But since I've attended this program, I've become an author, a published author. My story is in the book. <laughs> This is all because of the Boston Air program that came through. Nakia Hill was our um, workshop coordinator, and she came and she presented us with this workshop. So I said, maybe I can do that. But I was afraid, and I hadn't been writing anything. So she said, just write. Because writing can be healing. It can be you know, a, a tool to things that you've had buried down inside and you thought that you had forgotten, you're over it. Well, guess what? We found out that there was still more. So these were resiliency stories that we wrote about. And because of that, I'm still standing. And that's the name of my piece that I wrote in there. They were stories that a lot of us, some of the older women, well, she calls us seasoned women. Nikia did. So we're seasoned. But this is one. So I would like to, I've started writing again. So I'd like to share a piece that I've written because we need parking at our center. So I'd like for you to take your, put on your listening ears if you don't mind. Um, I entitled this, A Senior's Plea for Safe and Suitable Parking. Calling to our government officials far and wide, please lend your ears to this truth that cannot be denied. Grove Hall Senior Center is the place to be. 
for fellowship, game playing, and even a hot cup of coffee or tea. Seniors come to this center from near and far, some by public transportation, but many by car, to engage in various activities that enhance our lives for the better, which is the reason that I write this letter. You see, we need suitable off-street parking when we arrive at this center. But for the lack of it, many of us are not able to enter. Often inclement weather and grounds filled with snow will keep us in our homes with no place to go, only because we have no place to park at the center. We're making this plea officially to you for some day in the future you might need this service too. Our desire is to live long, healthy, and productive lives. Therefore, for us, safe and convenient parking should never be compromised. We are older senior citizens, and we need parking nearby. So we ask that you please give ear to our cry Please provide us with safe parking on the lot across the street so that we can attend our senior program without missing a beat. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Gloria Johnson, AKA Glowworm. And this is Abraham, my companion. I, I want to give a side take on this. I uh, am not from the community. However, I am a senior companion working downstairs. And I um, became involved in this Grove Hall program, which I I just so, I'm just so electrified in what I've seen and what I heard. I am a very good observer. And when I see things that are going on that is effective to seniors, I am 70 years old. And when people say you're old, I, I don't let people use that name with me because I am a 70 year older American not old, getting older. So the thing is, is that I also work as a respite worker from our program, the Senior Companion Program. And I work with a woman who is very well educated, but she has early dementia. So what I do is I accompany her to this program. I am a retired social worker. And because I've come to this program, I have been able to see that the director and the people are so involved that I didn't hear the drum, I didn't hear the drums. But we, I joined in the activities because I am a senior. I've always said when I worked, I hope that there will be some perks for me. And believe me, I've found some perks at the center. I am able to do the Japanese drumming, the Japanese drumming on Tuesdays. And let me tell you, the lady that I accompany, she is so involved in this activity. And had she, she, has, she stays with her daughter, and her daughter has to work. She called our agency here and said, we need somebody I need someone to accompany my mother to this program. And I was available. The lady is very charming. She's very engaging. And there couldn't be a better place. And when they said about parking, I don't drive. I take the ride. I take the handicap ride, which I call my Mercedes Benz. And I am very grateful for that ride that brings me back and forth and takes me all over the city to places I want to go. And if I might implore on you, money 
can be a small thing. But when you pull the resources in a community of people, you go in the pockets, you dig in the pockets, and you say, we want money. And we're here right now today to say, we want more money to provide the services for our programs. And they talked about isolated seniors. I have worked with so many isolated seniors in the community. And the women here and men that come to this program, they go back and they tell other folk in the community who are isolated. This is how we communicate. We don't need the news. We are the news. You see? We, we make the news because we're here. So I just want to say again to you right now, I'm here. We all here. You listen to us. And we really appreciate this from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very much. I'll start by saying um, that I feel really honored to share a space um, with so many elders today who are just so awesome. So thank you. My name is Sarah Rabb. I am the program director at Girls Leap. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization um, that partners frequently with Boston Center for Youth and Families. Um, I've had the privilege um, of working with youth in a, a number of different BCYF community centers, Vine Street, the Marshall, the Condon, the Perkins, so many more, Orenberger. I've been all over the city um, working with different BCYF organizations, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the youth who I work with, specifically the girls, and to advocate for girl-focused programming and after-school programming for youth. I'll back up for a second and just quickly tell you how I came to my work. Um, my background is in supportive services for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. I don't know if you are aware of some of the statistics. I don't like reducing people down to numbers. Um, but this is an, an epidemic in our country. It's an epidemic in our city. One in four women in this room are survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault. and. Unfortunately, um, from where I stand in the nonprofit space, we are seeing funding uh, really disappearing. Um, there are small nonprofits that serve girls, fortunately not ours yet, but are shutting down. Um, and I think that's a tragedy. In our programs, we focus on uh, building socio-emotional skills, which is a big fancy word, which means we teach girls how to set boundaries, how to uh, uh, deal with conflict, we teach them about healthy and unhealthy relationships, and we combine this uh, with a program that teaches them basic physical self-defense. For many of our students, this is the first time in their lives where they have felt strong, and it is powerful and it is incredible. And I get to do this work all over the city because of our partnership with BCYF. And just to give you an idea of the impact that this has, just thinking back to one program I had earlier this year, um, there was a girl I had in a workshop um, who was six, six years old, which is younger than me, we typically work with, um, and she became my, my best friend the first day because I drew a unicorn on her paper. Um, and, you know, and the second day I worked with her, she was kind of downcast, so I asked her what was up after we had finished that day, and we got to talking, and it turned out there were some things um, going on at home. And, I think probably because of some of the things that we had talked about. We talk about courage. We talk about standing up for yourself. Um, she opened up with me and then um, gave permission for me to share what she had shared with me with some BCYF staff. Um, and so I knew when I left that room, when I left her, um, that she was going to be supported that her family was, both mom and dad, were gonna be like supported by BCYF staff. Um, and she was able to do this because we were able to, to have a safe space for her to speak. That's just a piece of what girl-centered programming can do. 
I have other students I've worked with who uh, just at BCUX community centers this year um, who are dealing with a variety of issues at home, in school, violent bullying, um, sexual harassment by teachers. And for some of our students, this is the first time that they've shared these issues with any adult. Girl-centered programming allows us to create a space where it is safe for them to speak, for them to share, for them to feel empowered to ask someone else for help so that we can do something about it. So thank you so much um, for your support so far, um, and I just encourage you to keep supporting girl-centered programming through BCYF. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah uh, and uh, Michael, and of course, uh, the older and bolder seniors who uh, enlightened all of us and uh, brightened our day, that's for sure. Maybe you can bring some of that blood pressure stuff here in the council chamber. Uh, that, that would probably help out everybody just a little bit. Uh, so we're going to uh, enter our second round. Uh, we were joined by uh, Councilor Lydia Edwards, so I will go to uh, the good councilor from East Boston. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to first uh, say thank you for all your work. Uh, Michael, you know in East Boston you're well known and, and you've done a lot of work uh, around the city, but it's especially seen in East Boston at the Paris Street uh, BCYF. I, I think it's only enhanced. And I want to also give a huge shout out to your entire staff for all of the work on the night of the fire where we had the nine alarms. BCYF uh, stayed as open and as active, had the pizza, had the videos as long as the families needed them. So thank you so much. I, I would get into, I was listening all the staff, uh, listing all the staff members, but then I was like, I'm gonna get myself in trouble. <laughs> uh, I'll just say this, uh, I get to see so many people at the pool and at the, um, at the, uh, at the actual center where I'm, I'm now training and learning how to swim uh, there myself. So I wanna say thank you. Um, a couple other things so, so to pick up on, it's, we, we would love to engage in another conversation maybe about the Pino Center in over in East Boston. I think uh, it's another active place. It serves a very you know, uh, vulnerable population and we wanna make sure that the same investments we're seeing um, is also brought up there as well. Um, you know we have a lot of meetings there and folks go there, it's a, it's a well-known place, so I just wanna make sure that we highlight the Pino Center. Also, um, I wanted to, I know that you had a meeting already about the Nazaro Center, uh, so I won't repeat, <laughs> <laughs> nor do we need to go back uh, further into that, but just making sure that, I, I, I appreciate you coming out there. I, I know it was a difficult meeting, but I also know that you're committed to making sure that we have the best centers citywide, but also in the neighborhood, so we'll just keep working to make sure that that happens. Um, I did want to ask, uh, following up on last year's conversation, um, you guys were already taking the leadership and looking at the nonprofit relationship with the individual centers and streamlining the income, being able to account for the income, being able to make sure that we're all set. I'm sure you may have already answered that question, but if you could just let me know uh, what that update is. Um, I'm going to go first and then get mm. Yeah. Uh, well, recently, right now, I think we're in a good space. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, we've, we've worked through it. MOU process with a lot of the councils. Uh, one of the things that changed a lot was the way the fee structures were, the membership yeah. and rental fees of the facilities are now coming and being allocated to the city. And I think uh, what it did, it really began to help to really clarify a little bit of sort of the liabilities and risk is kind of associated, but to really clarify what our roles are, but to continue to augment our partnership because mm -hmm. at the end, you know, we depend on partners like, you know, like Girls Leap, but also like the councils to really deliver the services that we need. And we know we can't do it alone, and the only way to do it is when we invite crucial crucial people to be there. So I think that right now we're in a good space, and I think that one of the initiatives as we move forward for this year is to now look at how do we look at some of the other operational areas that might be gray, that we can add color together and continue to do that in a way that we're thinking forward and we're thinking about how do we continue to build a legacy that started together but how do we amplify it so that, that long after we're gone, that BCYF ideology of, of supporting and transforming lives continues to live in those spaces. So I think we're in a, a much better place uh, way back in the beginning when we started having the conversations because no one knew what the outcome was, but I think that the outcome has been well, well received. So do we see a movement to online payments, for example? I mean, I, we're still at money orders and I, you know, it's not an impossible thing to do, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, how do we how do we streamline some of that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Council, I mean, money orders was the 
easiest, most accountable means of getting payments at first to get this off the ground. <laughs> Obviously, this day and age, money orders isn't the preferred method, but we're, we're dead set of not, not accepting cash. Um, so yeah, that's kind I, of, I agree. Th that is a totally accountability type of thing that mm -hmm. money, money walks. And, and we don't want to see that happen. We don't want to see money gone missing or anything like that. And money just brings a lot of different issues that we didn't want to deal with. We've been in close connection with, with Treasury, um, working with them. Uh, also in line with our new uh, uh, data system RFP, mm -hmm. um, Treasury was included in those discussions so that we can start to look at how a new data tracking attendance system can help us with, 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 with tracking the payments and working with um, do it and Treasury on an invoice cloud type of, type of method, just whereas you would pay your excise tax online or you would pay your um, real estate tax online, you'd see an option for BCYF. They're going through a little bit of a um, uh, process to secure a new vendor for some of those things, so we're at a little bit of a holding pattern, but it's very much on, on the radar of Do It Treasury and ourselves to get that, that additional online credit card means of payment up and available to residents and constituents, but along with our new data system, it will allow for um, what we're asking for in the RFP is online applications and payment at the same time, so you're just coming in and, and, and streamlining the process, but yes, money order is a little archaic, but um, considering, you know, to date, I was talking earlier, we've collected 230 somewhat thousand dollars. Um, very few issues. People are being very understanding about getting a money order, and we've asked our staff to be understanding with folks that might come in that might not have it with them on the first day, or give them the time to procure one, or provide them the places where they can get them um, to try to make the transition as easy as possible. But we are very much in line with trying to move to a second option um, as soon as possible, but there's just some internal things um, that Treasury and Do It are, are situating before we move to the next step of implementation. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes Councilor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Council McCarthy. Um, I have a couple couple follow-up questions. Um, the Condon, the Condon gym, uh, especially in the summertime, the AC system, What's the latest on that? Um, it's brutally hot there. Um, kids playing basketball at, um, in the Condon in the summertime. But any any plans for that? So that uh, council, that's a, that's a Boston Public Schools facility. That the facilities responsibilities for that area would fall on um, Boston Public School uh, Boston Public Schools to address. Um, as we as we've been. Uh, you know, doing renovations and things. We're, we're adding air conditioning to our gyms um, because we're also cooling centers. And as several councils mentioned, we're emergency shelters also. And, and a lot of times the places that we have people sleep or use as a dormitory, dormitory is the gyms. So we're moving towards making sure that as we do projects, we are installing air conditioning throughout our facilities. But again, I know BPS sometimes um, in some of their gyms, they either, they may not even have air conditioning available in the gyms, um, but it's something we can follow up with uh, with regards to BPS facilities to see. Um, so you're saying that there is air conditioning and it's not working? Yeah, or it's, it's not working well. They, okay. they have uh, BNBL basketball there, yep. and the kids are playing basketball in the summertime in the evening, and it's very hot there. Yep. So that's something, you know, coordination with uh, BPS and BCYF would be, would be important. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the latest, um, how are we doing at Josiah Quincy with programming? Uh, there's, uh, there's the Josiah Quincy, uh, the Quincy Community Center is, is, is you know, great. I, I see that, you know, I think we all see that as one of our, you know, better functioning um, community centers because of their, you know, a great relationship they have with, with the school and with BCNC. And we have an amazing staff over there um, that, you know, we, we hold in very high regard. Um, they have a pool, so, you know, there's swimming programs, um, there's after school programs. I mean, I think they're one of the sites that, the model really works well together where the partners are, are really on the same page where um, the school, the community center, and the nonprofit being BCNC work pretty seamlessly together. But um, programming there seems to be, you know, meeting the needs of the community, whether it's, you know, um, I know they love to play um, they volleyball. To, yeah, and, volleyball, basketball. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to have better coordination with uh, BPS and BCYF on the gymnasium as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not in the best condition. The Blackstone, what's happening with the swimming pool? Any issues with the pool? Not the, not the way we're of, no. Is it in good shape? 
Yes, as far as we know, yeah, no, the pool's up and functioning, and um, we don't have any any issues where we're at the at the Blackstone pool. I mean, our aquatic staff um, does an amazing job at, at at maintaining our pools, even the ones that are in Boston Public Schools. We typically take the lead on kind of managing those and, and addressing those, but. Our, um, our two aquatics managers, are well, along with our, our on-site pool staff, really do a good job at, you know, keeping keeping the pools clean and, and within within uh, acceptable limits and whatnot. So, um, uh, the pools are really some of our biggest assets, and, and, and the Blackstone seems to be no different than, than the others in offering good aquatics programming. How are we doing at the Tynan um, programming? Any issues with the Tynan? No. No, I think I think the Tynan's going well. We're, we're waiting on. Um, we have a we have a vacant position right now that we're working on filling, but other than that, uh, John and his staff uh, seem to be doing a, um, a very good job. Uh, we added an additional person actually recently too mm -hmm. to help monitor um, the building. We've been working closely with with Boston Public Schools around um, access and entry and safety uh, at that facility. So um, things seem to be things seem to be pretty good uh, over at the Tynan, and again the staff over there is is doing uh, an amazing job and, and good things over there with programming. We get updates regularly from John. As we head into the summertime, um, any issues at all with hiring lifeguards or reducing um, the number of hours because we don't have the necessary lifeguards at BCYF pools, whether the, whether it's the Condon or the Blackstone? So g getting, getting um, lifeguards is definitely getting to be more challenging. Um, our uh, regional operations managers and our aquatics managers and our site staff work really hard. Um, it's not just a problem that BCYF is seeing. I think it's a problem that's being seen at DCR, YMCA, um, trying to recruit lifeguards. Um, we, we start the process very early on in, in January, February to start recruitment. We have to hire about 72 seasonal positions to man all of our pools in addition to all of our permanent full-time Lifeguards, we offer free lifeguard trainings at our sites to try to help with, with building recruitment. So if any of the you know councils or anyone in the districts that have strong swimmers that just need the certification, um, you know, we have offerings where we'll actually certify the kids for free. Um, yeah. It's just the cost of the certification. Yeah, I'd hate to see cuts to um, pools, the hours, because we don't have the right... Um, right lifeguards maybe mm -hmm. we have to do the outreach earlier than even january but um you know not having those types of programming is is, is a cut to services if, if we don't have the lifeguards yeah no and I, I haven't you know we don't foresee any cuts or didn't we have any cuts i mean if overtime is necessary or whatever it takes we haven't we haven't cut back on services but obviously our goal every year is to fill all the positions and and, and have it appropriately staffed but just keep you know we deal with 16 year olds and older so a lot of the times we can start we could start in september if we wanted to but kids are in school and kids will be kids and um, typically see that they wait you know right now is where we're getting into our busy time of we're gonna get a large influx of kids that are gonna apply at the same time and go through the hiring process at the same time so our goal is to fill them all um, but we do what we need to if we fall short on, on our numbers to make sure that we don't cut any hours or, or access am I out of time mr. chairman oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that was that beeping sound <laughs> Councillor Sabi George Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on the lifeguard question because I think it's really important that we're training kids to be lifeguards, that we're giving them that opportunity because it's such a fantastic summer job, if not a year-long uh, job opportunity. How many kids do we teach to swim through our BCYF centers? Do we know that number? I, I'm trying to think. I don't. I can't think offhand because you know the reality is is that. A year ago, a lot of those swim lessons were actually went through the councils, and now okay. we're actually taking those things back uh, to hopefully create more consistency. But I can definitely get you those numbers. Great, that'd be a great number to know, yeah. and then it'd yeah. be nice but to it, see how many of those kids we can convert into yeah. lifeguards because it's such a great summer job opportunity yeah. and something that we need. But I'd also like to see and it's, our kids learn how to swim. And it's our fiscal year 20 also initiative too to also look at how do we deepen our relationships with the school sites that we have the pool management side of it and how do we can make, kind of make that connection. Even right. if it's all of a sudden it could happen during in class as an opportunity to, to promote a, you know, having those skills, but then further developing those skills to create a pipeline not only for us, but also for the other partner organizations that struggle, the WISE, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and DCR to do that. And they're all struggling for life. Yeah, they all, everyone struggles yeah. with it. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then can we talk a little bit about 
um, school year and summer, summer and full year and school year, summer or jobs, not summer jobs, but jobs for our young people. How many, I think you went over these numbers a little bit earlier in the presentation, but how many summer jobs do we provide our city's youth? Uh, we provide, we provide 3,300 jobs during the summer months. And do we have any year long jobs? Um, we typically provide between five and 600 um, jobs during the winter year, winter season, school year. And any that are 12 months? I'm sorry? Any of those five to 600, are they 12 month a year jobs? So students that are working in the school year continue with that same role? Um, some of them continue, but they are not 12 month jobs. The okay. school year program runs from November to April. And then the summer jobs program runs July and August. Right. And what are the, um, what's the pay rate that our students are receiving? Are uh, minimum wage currently is $12 um, for 2019 going to 2020, and it's expected to go up a dollar every year um, until I think 2022. Yep, so maybe? we are at that. We're at. Our students are, and is there an opportunity for returning students? that are returning to the same job to, or a young person, to receive that an, or a bump up in pay? Um, there is not, no. Okay, that's it for me. Oh, 19 seconds to spare. Yep, too late. <laughs> uh, Councilor Kim Jean. Thank you so much. I wanna continue on the, the youth jobs. Um, can you talk about whether, so you mentioned, I think, in your presentation that uh, young people can get suits and um, skills around interviewing, I think you said, yes? Yeah, that was an event that we did um, event. in the fall. It was a one-time event that we are looking to um, have that event again, probably around September, October. Okay, and are you thinking about um, beyond a kind of a one-time event, any kind of soft, or at least if not doing it yourself through your office, um, connecting our young people with through the partnerships. So uh, some feedback that I've uh, heard from some business owners in the district who are very committed to employing young people or just people in general is um, a concern around a lack of what they're calling soft skills, mm -hmm. you know, showing up on time, you know, you know how to treat, you know, customers um, with the respect and being courteous and, and those types of things. So I'm wondering, uh, what, if anything, um, your shop can do in terms of really helping our young people. And, and, and what you do in terms of a summer job is so important because that's where a lot of these skills are built. Sure. And, and folks who don't have these same kind of opportunities may not learn these soft skills, but I wonder if there's a way to be more intentional around the soft skills. Yeah, there is. Um, this past year, uh, through our career development team, um, we actually implemented um, just some drop-in workshops around soft skills for young people. I think we saw about 40 young people participate in those um, workshops throughout the school year. Um, so we're gonna look to um, find ways to expand that um, to community-based organizations um, and also share that with um, folks at Boston Public Schools as well. All right, and you had mentioned in the earlier round in response to Councilor Campbell, um, this, this gap of the young people who apply and not knowing how many of them end up in jobs through other organizations like the yeah. PIC. Is there an effort underway to try to understand um, what those numbers are? Yes, there is. Okay. Um, there's an effort under, underway to um, better align just services um, when it comes to youth jobs across all those providers. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate um, the work that you do. In closing, just so that I don't forget, Commissioner, you may have seen an email from me earlier today, and so there's a, a resident in my district who's concerned about signage on one of the buildings, and I just wanted to make sure you knew about the email and was able to help them connect with uh, stakeholders in the area. Yes, yes um, I did. So and, I've I, had, and I've had a personal conversation with them. Wonderful, too, so I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councilor. Uh, thank you. President Andrea Campbell. Um, thank you, Council McCarthy, and um, thank you to the testimony and, and your response, frankly, to the putting in the request for the crosswalk situation at the Grove Hall Senior Center. Really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank, um, um, I, I think it's Sarah? Sarah. Sarah from Girls Leap for testifying about that partnership. I was going to bring up uh, Councilor Flynn earlier in his questions, talked about 
uh, some of the work we're trying to do based on some hearing orders we filed related to domestic violence, sexual assault, um, and frankly taking it out of the context of just what's been happening in with bars and, and that kind, and being intoxicated, it's bigger than that. Um, and we're, we're doing some work with Northeastern Law School, but um, it was really great to hear about the deep partnership with Girls Sleep, which is an incredible organization, and our centers. I didn't know the extent, frankly, um, or that it was connected to so many uh, BCYF centers. So this is great, so we look forward to pulling um, all of you into this work, including um, the organization, Rashad, that you mentioned that I didn't know about as well, um, because young people are dealing with this, including in our, in our BPS schools. So this was very helpful. And then lastly, I don't know if this was discussed earlier, the revamped street worker program, what's happening, and what, what does SOAR stand for again, and, and what's the new model and everything gonna look like? I think many folks are excited <laughs> about um, switching it up and doing things a little differently and making sure that we have folks who um, have the skill sets um, to really deliver on what is a really tough job and engaging um, at times a tough um, uh, population of folks who really need services and a great level of patience. So I'd be curious, again, remind me what SOAR means and then what the new model is gonna look like. Thank you for asking the question, Councilor. So SOAR is Street Outreach. Thank you. Street Outreach Advocacy and Response. So it's SOAR Boston. And essentially, someone inquired about the positions earlier um, and the positions that are allocated to the street worker program or the SOAR Boston program are gonna be um, uh, essentially case managers, a service delivery team, which will include a service delivery manager. And so that's gonna be an essential part of the model. So it's not just about the street outreach, but ensuring that there's an entire team that's partnering with the street workers as they're engaging and building relationships that they're able to have this, um, these resource coordinators uh, supporting, case managing, and continuously keeping the young uh, individuals we're working with in services. So it's essential, it's, it's an essential part of the model is this behavior change through services, resources, and a wraparound approach. The street worker working with the resource coordinator. Is there like a write up, a new org chart, or some? Yes, we can that share that with you. Perfect, because I know um, some folks are beginning to get questions, particularly around some of the the union piece and, and the movement. Um, I think most folks welcome the, the revamp and redesign to truly be as impactful as possible. Yeah. How is this gonna be funded? What is, what is it going to cost? What does it look like? So there's an additional $560,000. Yeah, I was gonna say half, about half a million. Yeah, about half a million dollars that are gonna go into it for the resource coordinators. Again, there's um, a service delivery manager that will oversee that team of coordinators and case managers. In addition to that, we're adding a data and impact specialist so that the strategies are informed in real time and we're using real uh, data and information about what's happening on the streets, but we're also tracking uh, our impact towards these goals of supporting behavior change in the individuals that the uh, teams are working with. Um, and just it, lastly, I guess, sure. and my time is up, but total, total number of folks in the total budget for the entire program? Total, I'm not sure if it's total budget. 42 individuals? But I'm not sure of the figure in the budget. 42 individuals in total, total and budget. that includes, again, the current street workers, senior street workers, and management team. So it's 42 total. In total budget um, of the program? We'll have to, I think we'll have to get back to okay. the total budget. Um, thank you, and thank you for all that you guys do. Um, not only you guys, the folks behind us, and of course the folks who are on the ground at the centers, um, who usually can't take the time off to, to come here. I'm really grateful to those folks on the ground as well, um, who, open, who, open up, who open up their doors um, when our residents and families are truly going through tragedies, stay after hours, go above and beyond. Really want to extend my appreciation and gratitude to them as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Councilor Edwards. Follow up. I wanted to make sure I had my uh, dates uh, set for the pool in East Boston. I know that there's going to be a major investment in it. We're very excited for that. Mm -hmm. I understand it's going to be this fall. Yes. So we're we're in design um, right now. We're, we would never want to close prior or leading into a in summer. summer. Um, so yeah, it would be. We're looking at sometime in the fall. Um, still doing some some designs. Uh, it's a great project. The reason it's taken a while is because. 
Um, the mayor and the budget office have been kind enough to increase the budget several times for us to able to accommodate some of the high level things that important changes we want to see made uh, to complement you know the new community center so yeah we're shooting for the fall council it may it may be off a little bit but that's what our current schedule uh, project schedule looks like is getting it away under the in the fall um, but again that might be I think that'd be safe to say that we'll go into construction in, in 2019 it's just a matter of if it's you know September or is it October November somewhere around there but that's that's the um, that's the target right now with uh, since we're since we are going into the summer I am curious about the outreach for water safety and training uh, for families at BCYF facilities I just had a wonderful conversation with a constituent who was really interested in, in seeing as, as young as K0, K1s, uh, possibly getting some sort of water orientation. Um, as you know, it's one of the leading causes of death in, in young people, 0 to 14, uh, many of whom are kids of color who uh, disproportionately don't know how to swim, but have uh, a great excitement and plan on being around water all throughout the summer. So there's a disconnect about having, you know, you know, between looking good <laughs> in a swimsuit and going out and having a great time, but also knowing how to save your life if you needed to. So um, I am I'm just curious. And like I said, I'm learning too, mm -hmm. but I'm, 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 I would love to hear a little bit more about some of the outreach or, you know, that's going on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think we rely obviously heavily on, um, you know, social media, the BCYF website that I know, um, our folks have gone through great uh, lengths to improve access and, and putting as much information on the websites as possible. Um, Sandy Holden and Dawn work hard to make sure, and our aquatics managers make sure that pool schedules are up there and different things are up there so folks know when things are happening. Um, but also, the biggest way that we, you know, advertise is still we're a community center, so a lot of the times the way people find out is by walking into a site and asking, you know, what where they can get stuff when there's classes. Um, obviously, I know Councillor Asabi George asked a question earlier um, and about swim lessons. It looks like this fiscal year there's been 600 children who have been involved in swim lessons uh, to date this fiscal year. Um, so we obviously, you know, we have a lot of different needs to prioritize, but obviously teaching children how to swim. Uh, a lot of our sites have baby splash, right. which is, you know, parent and child and, in, in, you know, from pretty much from six months up. Um, you know, really introducing them to the water early mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, that, is, that is safe and parents can take part. And then, you know, from swim, from swim lessons to swim team to, you know, high school swimming to our junior lifeguard program to uh, summer lifeguards to permanent lifeguards. Like, we do everything we can to increase um, folks' access. Obviously, just being in, in, in the city in an urban environment, not everybody has a pool in their backyard, especially right. in some of the areas um, that, that we're in. And, and we want to do all we can to increase not only access to the pool, but like you said, Council, really making sure that kids know how to swim and mm -hmm. kids find themselves in a situation in water that they can they can do what they need to do necessary to because a kid doesn't know their limits sometimes either yeah. um they may not, you know <laughs> my daughter you know thinks she can just jump in the pool and it, god forbid someone's not there what what you know if the child needs to be prepared to know what what to do in that situation and we can so we're not only trying to help kids swim but we're trying you know we want to save lives we want to make sure kids aren't afraid of the water you got right. sometimes city kids you get older and you go off and everyone's swimming and we want to make sure that our kids can can enjoy those things also but we're always looking for ways to increase swim lessons increase access um and like i said we start as early as six months um up but i would definitely encourage folks to visit um bcf's website off of the city of boston's page and, and get information or I'll just go down to your local community center or a local pool and, and get information on when swim lessons are happening thank you and and also just to add um the regional operation managers and the aquatics um, managers do a really good job of um engaging the staff on a local level because obviously they're the ones who have the direct impact and the direct connections to the families that come into our spaces and so they host um, um regular lifeguard trainings um, and safety trainings on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. which is um, critically important. And Jeff Mackey and um, Tony Rosario, they do a fantastic job with taking a look at trends nationally and then getting that information out um, on a local level to our staff so that they can share it with the families who come into our spaces. Just a quick follow-up, since everyone else was didn't Everybody either. else ignore me. Go ahead. I'm just saying. I, I'm no, just saying. I, know what you're saying. I just. Um, I wanted to talk to swing a little bit over. I guess it's it's partly with the work with the girls and with the street workers and in general. There's two two areas that I wanted to really touch on, uh, um, both under the the um, the topic of trauma. Um, 
and how BCYF is dealing with um, intergenerational trauma, how you're dealing with kids who are carrying a lot into the centers. Um, is there meditation? Is there mediation training for conflict resolution? Uh, talk about soft skills, right? Not just learning how to interview for a job, but how to communicate when you are very angry with somebody and how to get, uh, I, these are all, to me, important skill sets. Even adults need to learn them. But since you have the kids and they are, are kind of already within your supervision and soft skills are something we want to be teaching them. I'm hoping that when it comes to, to knowing trauma and as much as we know about trauma, how are we helping them? That's one bucket. And then the other bucket is about you as individuals. Um, I worked in legal services. I was an attorney. I dealt with self tra uh, excuse me, sex trafficking, labor trafficking victims, domestic violence victims, child uh, children who were abused. And so one thing we began to notice, even in legal services with our team, with the social workers and things like that, is the secondhand uh, PTSD. And so I'm curious amongst yourselves as city employees, your own self-care methods, looking out for your, you and your staff and your teams, their own, um, their own PTSD or dealing with secondhand PTSD and their own health. So how, how you have encouraged or will, will encourage uh, self-care. Yeah, um, all, all important issues and, and, and thanks for raising them. You know, as we think about um, the, the, the trauma that um, many young people um, have to deal with, and oftentimes we kind of stop at violence, but we know that there's many forms of um, trauma that, mm -hmm. that, that um, um, young people experience. And certainly, um, you know, one of the things that we think is important is that we um, give our staff, um, particularly our youth workers and um, street workers, the skills to at least be able to recognize that. And so um, we partner with the Boston Public Health Commission, and they've taken all of our staff um, through trauma-informed training. And so, you know, they, they certainly have an understanding of, of, of um, what that means to be trauma-informed. But also, you know, there are rules when you come into community centers. And sometimes, uh, as part of that training, we have have to be mindful of what some of those rules might do to individuals, particularly young people, because it can trigger trauma. And so that might mean that organizationally we have to look at some of our policies as well to sort of um, um, help support young people when it comes to trauma. You know, we're, we're always um, encouraging um, our staff to really um, you know, do whatever it is in a healthy way that enables them to lead productive lives. And clearly, one of those things is making sure that for, on a supervisory level, that the supervisors are really providing that support to the um, frontline staff. Um, certainly, um, you know, as we continue to move forward with the work, it's going to be important that we continue to provide um, some of the um, staff development and training opportunities um, that is needed for um, all of our staff. Um, and so, we, we certainly will continue to work closely with the Public Health Commission. Um, we are always encouraging our staff to take advantage of um, employment assistance program. We've had them come out on a number of occasions to just make them aware of the um, services that are um, available to them. And one of the things that we're looking to do moving forward is potentially bring on um, a um, clinical um, staff to support oh. our staff, so as well as um, the young people. So, you know, it's certainly something that we, we're mindful of and we know how important it is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Counselor. <clears throat> okay, so that wraps up this hearing. I want to thank you guys uh, very much for being here. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we're going to adjourn this hearing, uh, and because Carrie Jordan, who's the best, who's behind the scenes, he's going to flip the, I almost said tape, but digital, it's all digital now. And we're going to start up the other hearing right out of the gate because everybody wants to go see their family at home. And it's the first time we've seen the sun in like two weeks. So <laughs> I'm sure everybody would like to get home. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, this is uh, docket number 0622 through 0625 and dockets number 0626 through 0628, the capital budget appropriations as well as the operating budget for BCYF. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Ms. Tim McCarthy. I'm the vice chair of the, hold on one second. We're going to take a quick recess till we clear it out.
Good evening, everybody. My name is Tim McCarthy. I'm the District 5 City Council. I'm the Vice Chair of the Boston City Council for Ways and Means. Uh, I want to remind you that this is a public hearing recorded and broadcast on channel Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Verizon Channel 1964, and streamed uh, live on Boston.gov. Um, Please silence your phones and other devices, and we do have public testimony if you so choose to do so. Today's hearing is on uh, BCYF, Boston Centers for Youth and Families, and Youth Engagement and Employment. Uh, no, actually, this is not on that. This is docket number 060637, a message and order authorizing uh, a limit for the Boston Centers for Youth and Families revolving fund for fiscal 2020 to pay salaries and benefits of other employees to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the city hall child care. This revolving fund shall be credited with any and all receipts from tuition paid by parents or guardians for children enrolled at the center. Uh, recipient, uh, receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $750,000. Uh, today we have uh, Will Morales, the Commissioner of BCYF, as well as Michael Spuzio, the Deputy Commissioner of Admin and Finance, and I am joined by my colleague and good friend, Councillor Anissa Sabi-George. Oh, and Kim Janey, my other good friend. From 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 Roxbury, gotcha. Um, Michael, all you. Um, so yeah, we're just we're here today to ask the council for uh, to approve the revolving fund for city hall child care, um, which is the uh, only child care program that BCYF directly operates, which is housed in this in this in this building here at city hall on the fourth floor. Um, current enrollment, I believe, is forty seven um, children right now from. Uh, infants to toddlers to preschool um, and we use the fees that we charge the weekly fees that we charge to parents to uh, go into the revolving fund and then ultimately be expended for salaries uh, health insurance and different things and uh, this year's an exciting year for city hall child care um, due to you know the work with with chief brophy and in may uh, mayor walsh and making some investments down at city hall child care um, this year, which included some um, new painting, um, new furniture, new equipment, um, new flooring, new carpeting, uh, as well as a soon-to-be new new playground on the exterior plaza for, for the children. So um, we're really excited about some of the um, investments that are being made um, that were direct requests on behalf of the mayor to see that space be uh, improved. So we're excited, and the staff do great work uh, on a daily basis down there caring for those uh, almost 50 folks. Uh, 50 children down there and, and I've visited numerous times and, and the staff and the children are great and uh, really enjoy the program and I think it's a really important service that we offer to uh, folks here in the building and outside the building um, to have an affordable uh, high quality accredited program here in the building that um, you know is really a with the expense of child care these days is a really a, a huge huge help to the families that, that take part in it so um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Councillor, we're here to request uh, the um, revolving fund be uh, approved by the council so that we can continue to operate um, this program through the method that we've used in the past, which is the revolving fund to pay the salaries and, and other expenses associated with the program. Yep. Thank you very much, Michael. I, I will tell you just uh, this is the easiest hearing we can possibly have. Um, I love having the kids in the building, and I think, uh, I mean, my, my, my baby days are over. Uh, but um, having said that, Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's Day, seeing the kids in the building, mm -hmm. um, it's fantastic. And I know it's so easy for the parents who work here. Uh, they do a wonderful job. I honestly have never heard a bad thing about that child care. Uh, once in a while, a cold will rip through the place. But other than that, um, <laughs> it, it's just a wonderful place. And I certainly love having them in the building. Uh, Councilman Anissa Sabi-George. I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, that's that. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming in. Uh, again, this is docket number 0637, a uh, message in order authorizing the, the limit for Boston Centers for Youth and Families revolving fund for 2020 for $750,000 uh, for the City Hall Child Daycare. This hearing is now adjourned.